when you first heard that they were making Virginia Woolf into a movie, I understand that uh, Elizabeth Taylor would not have been your first choice. No, that, let's get the story straight here. Okay, that's, <coughs> I went that's to, what you're here for. Yeah, I went to uh, Los Angeles to talk to uh, one of the Warner brothers. I guess it was Jack Warner. And I asked him before I, before I gave them the rights, I said, who are you putting in, my, in, in, in the movie of my play? I want to know the cast. And he said, yeah, well, I'm buying it, he said, in that awful possessive way. I'm buying it for Betty Davis and James Mason. And I thought that was going to be wonderful because they were the correct, correct age. Betty was 52 at the time, and Mason had always been 46, or however George is meant to be. And I thought that was great. And so on the basis of that guarantee from Jack Warner, that's why I sold the rights of, of Virginia Woolf to the movies. But there's this thing called movie magic, isn't there? A studio chief who lied. I, I, I don't Gee, understand Can you imagine this. such a thing? I was a kid. I was naive. I didn't, you know. And so uh, Betty Davis turned into, into Elizabeth Taylor. The only problem, Elizabeth did probably her best film work. Uh, unquestionably, but she was 32 when she did it. That's 20 years younger than the character, and uh, that created a few problems. But, but they were infinitely more famous. But at the end, you did like the movie. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, my best basic problem with the movie, I was still very naive. I wrote it in color, but the film was in black and white. <laughs> I thought that was very odd. Uh, but then I realized that back in those days, serious films had to be in black and white. Only musicals and, and, and froth could, could be in color. And the only other thing that bothered me, and still bothers me about the movie, I saw a rough cut of, of the film uh, in, in Hollywood before, before they put the, the film music in it. And without that awful film music, it was tough. It was a tough, serious film. The film music made it sentimental. And uh, you've got the names George and Martha from our first president yeah, in sure. well? Yeah, sure. That would be fun. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> Why would that be fun? Uh, I just thought it would be fun at the time. Why I thought it would be fun, I don't remember. And, and I know you've to told the story a million times, but the way the place that you got the title for the movie was uh, when you were having a drink in a bar? Yeah, in, in Greenwich Village. Uh, there was a saloon on 10th Street that a lot of us used to go to, a lot of writers used to go to. And it was one of those bars where people would do graffiti on the walls in, uh, in, in chalk. And somebody had written in, in, in uh, soap, I guess, on, on, on the mirror behind the bar, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Exclamation point, question mark. And this was 10 years before I started writing plays, but I remembered it the whole time, so I thought that was good. And so I started writing this play, my fourth play, called The Exorcism. And by the time I got to the second act, I was calling it the exorcism or who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> but by the time I finished it, I got wise, and I called it who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. When Tennessee Williams wrote a play called Streetcar Named Desire, that wasn't the first title. What was it? It was called The Poker Night. <laughs> Boy, is Streetcar a much better name, huh? Much better and who's name. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf is a much better title than... Uh, and what was it, The Exorcism? Sure, and there would have been no song to go along with that for, for Martha sure. to sing. <laughs> but it's interesting that we were not allowed to use the tune for the, from the cartoon because they wanted to charge us an awful lot of money for using that. So uh, we, we made up another tune and used it. We got something on the public domain. So that must be uh, some brain of yours to have this title in your head for 10 years and then all of a sudden to pull it out of whatever compartment. My mind is filled with extrania. <laughs> but it's extrania that you have access to. Sure, That's, of course. Th are you a very organized person in, like, w in, uh, outside of your brain? Do you have like all, all your drawers, uh, you know where everything is, and in the, in the house everything is? I don't know where anything is. <laughs> Only in your brain? That's all, yes. And, um, I'm, I'm something of a Luddite. I barely can type, and I don't use all these new electronic things we're supposed to do. Cell phones are going to be the death of me. Maybe literally, if you believe the brain cancer yes, rumors. Yes, apparently, yes. So when you write a play, then, you're doing it in longhand? Yes, of course. It's called manuscript. <laughs> yes, it is. It used to be. <laughs> it used to be, yeah. <laughs> How's your handwriting? Uh, There's the problem. I write with a kind of shorthand, and if I don't put something down, if I don't type something up, which I can still do, within a week after I've written it, I have to guess at what I've written. And, and sometimes that makes my plays a lot more experimental than I intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think your, your legacy is going to be then? 
I don't think about stuff like that. Maybe he was useful. That's enough.